three million pounds. Three years in the making. Brought you the story of evolution as it's never been seen before. Using cutting-edge computer animation, Walking with Monsters breathed life into a host of bizarre and unknown creatures, from the giant Brontoscorpio to the killer Dimetrodon. But Walking with Monsters is part of a much bigger picture. A 15 million pound programme-making odyssey, which began with much more famous monsters. Way before Walking with Monsters, Walking with Dinosaurs made television history by bringing prehistory to life on our screens for the very first time. It was seen by a staggering 400 million viewers worldwide. And with its successor, Walking with Beasts, it managed to achieve the impossible. It made paleontology sexy. The creators of these three series transported viewers back hundreds of millions of years but we will take a smaller step. We'll travel back just one decade into the 1990s to tell the story of the Walking With trilogy in all of its carnivorous, computer-generated glory. Probably almost 10 years ago now, the BBC wanted to do a big landmark series about paleontology. The real breakthrough idea was the idea of a, of a full-on natural history of dinosaurs where you see them in their real past glory rather than just as bones in the ground. And really I think the, the problem was that by then Jurassic Park had been made and people's expectation of what you could see with dinosaurs had got quite high. So my starting point was how could we bring those sort of quality graphics to television. I can remember Tim coming to me for the first time and asking whether we could do two hours of Jurassic Park quality uh, com computer animated dinosaurs for a television program at television budgets and I said no. So I was, went away and talked to other post-production houses and interestingly while I was talking to another one they said oh yes we've heard of this project but isn't Mike at Framestore going to do this? And so I think between me first seeing him and then meeting him again, he had changed, he had made his mind up. That night when I went home, I was thinking, what if somebody else says yes and they actually succeed and I will be the person who turned it down? So that made me really, really positive I wanted to do it. The first step towards realizing their vision was to take a quick weekend trip back into prehistory to make a pilot or test version. This is the first time this footage has ever been seen. The BBC put up some money and left me by myself to wander off to shoot a pilot, which started off as being about two minutes long, but I think it ended up as six minutes. And that involved going, looking around for somewhere which we could shoot as the back place, the place where the dinosaurs would be. And uh, some paleobotanist suggested the Mediterranean forests in Cyprus. When we got there, I put on my dinosaur boots and with one cameraman, we filmed a series of scenes, really just guessing what we would put in them. We had done a little storyboard, um, and that was the start of it all, really. This animation may be crude compared to the roaring, salivating creations of the eventual series, but it does give a hint of things to come. This female Eustreptus fondulus is hunting. With keen senses and a camouflaged body, she can ambush the fastest prey. However, sometimes luck is not with her. A 20-ton cetiosaur has little need for stealth. The herd moves like giant bulldozers through the trees. It was actually magic to me as well, seeing the final tape and seeing these sort of dramatic sequences that made you think you really were there in the past and that these, these dinosaurs really did live. And I saw later, later on, that he had to do all sorts of 
things himself, like being on the beach, bashing a log into the water to create splashes. And the next moment, he's, he's not there, and it's a dinosaur. We, we then had to start fundraising, though, and seriously, once we had the tape. And that was another big, you know, big challenge to us, because we had to raise money for what was, was the most expensive factual series ever to be made. The massive research effort involved over 400 paleontologists for walking with dinosaurs alone. This resulted in the detailed storyboards that kicked off the production process. When we have to start making these programmes, the first thing you need to do is to effectively get together your cast list. So you need to know which animals you're going to be portraying and at what period in time they are alive. Once we've got the cast list together, the next thing is to do an all-out research job on them. So we ask all the experts, we consult all the scientific publications we can find, and we start to slowly build storylines around all that. We do get mini storylines preserved in the fossil record. We sometimes get a little bit of a hint about the activity of animals. We find, for example, uh, evidence of predatory attacks that took place. We find bones with teeth embedded in them. We find footprints, or trackways in fact, that show a dinosaur was walking along, maybe with a youngster in tow, or maybe it was limping. We, we, we get these mini storylines. We wrote out a treatment which described exactly what we hoped would be in the pictures and what the narrator was saying. And we started to design what you would see, shot by shot. And actually the storyboard artist brought a lot to this because he came from a very dramatic film background. So as we began to plot out our pictures, because in fact we could do anything uh, because these creatures would be created later, storyboard artists really pushed our stories along saying, well, why don't we try that and why don't we try that? And so essentially brought a lot, of, a lot more drama into some of the scenes. After storyboarding, the filmmakers ventured out into the real world, travelling from South Africa to New Zealand to find backdrops for the series. Even then, the stars of the films, the dinosaurs themselves, existed only in their imagination. The whole filming of Walking with Dinosaurs was the most amazingly surreal experience. There's us in the middle of nowhere and a bunch of cameras and saying, OK, what are we filming? Well, we're filming nothing. The animals, they're not there and we've got to imagine them. And we've got to do everything for them because they don't yet exist. So we were going along, setting the camera up, filming an empty shot, and then going around sort of kicking up dust, knocking over trees, moving branches, all that kind of thing. All the things that they would do if they bothered to turn up. If a creature's walking through a sandy desert, you need to create the footfalls, you need to puff up sand. If they're walking through water, you need to create the interactions with water. And we had this big scene where our amphibians in the Carboniferous swamps were jumping out out of water and catching dragonflies. So we dressed these two guys in black bin bags, covered their heads in black bin bags. We had them sitting in the middle of this swamp, jumping up and then jumping down, and jumping up and then jumping down. And you realise when we looked at them, they looked exactly like some strange little gimp things. But, of course, this is a public place, and ever so often we would get American canoeists going by, <laughs> and they would see these guys jumping up and down in these gimp suits, with me going, faster, higher, would completely freak them out. For those big close-up moments, the crews got to wear the ultimate accessory, a foam and silicon animatronic mock-up of the creatures. When you're working with animatronics, you know, they're just rubber. Yeah, that's all they are, rubber or foam or what have you. And we want them to sort of salivate, spit and drool and, and all those kind of things. And we tend to be in quite remote places and the best way to make a, an animatronic drool is to use KY jelly. I've got so many experiences of kind of the fixer going off and, and sort of go into a chemist and say, I want a hundred boxes of KY jelly. And he'd, he'd always come back a little bit embarrassed, and, but basically we'd, we'd clean out, wherever we went, we'd be cleaned out of KY jelly. So I, I'm not sure what that meant for the, the sex life of those places after we'd, after we'd been there. But there we go, we had some drooling dinosaurs nonetheless. Making animatronic slaver may be a challenge. But conjuring up living creatures out of thin air requires a tricky process of computer animation. The process has several stages, the first of which is the shape of the creature. We were lucky to have two sculptors who are really skilled at looking at fossil records and recreating creatures from them. It's a sort of forensic job, really. 
They created clay sculptures of each of the dinosaurs, which we then scanned with a scanning system we really had to build up from scratch, which enabled us to scan in these clay models in great detail. The next stage is to bring in the animators. And what the animator does is simply, frame by frame, pose the creature. And then the computer will fill in the odd frames in between the keyframes, as we call them, and that will give a smooth movement, so you've got a creature that has movement. The next stage is to place that creature onto the background and in order to place it onto the background you've got to match where the camera was when it filmed the background picture. Our biggest challenge is always to make the dinosaurs look as realistic in the shots as possible, to really feel that they're in that background, and walking through the forest, uh, breaking the light as it passes across them and casting shadows on the ground and on the trees. After 18 gruelling months assembling the dinosaur cast, finally, opening night arrived. What we didn't really estimate was just how many people would turn up for that first episode. And it was astonishing. And the same thing happened later in America. So the kind of this appetite was there. And indeed, I think the, the delivery to this great big audience and families loving it, all that made it a big, big event. This is Brachiosaurus, a 13-meter-high sauropod that specializes in grazing on the treetops. With chisel-like teeth, his kind can effortlessly harvest cones and fresh leaves no other dinosaur can reach. And they have grown enormous on it. These adults weigh over 70 tons, making them the largest land animals that have ever existed. About 14 million people watched it on the first night and another four or five on the Sunday, which made it, you know, the top, one of the top 20 programmes the BBC's ever had, which was fantastic, except I thought, well, there was a hell of a lot of trailing and they all loved it, but next week it's going to drop like a stone. And really the, the, the nicest moment for me was the second week when the audiences were 12 and a half million. So, in other words, everyone was talking about it, they liked it and they wanted to see more. The series transformed its cast of dinosaurs into natural history superstars. It went on to be the most watched programme ever on the Discovery Channel and was sold in practically every country in the world, from France and Germany to China and Japan. I think it's been very helpful in infusing young people about paleontology. We've seen an enormous upsurge in interest in the university, many more people applying to study degrees in the subject. As part of my PhD, I go into local schools to promote science education and obviously I'm doing that as a paleontologist. It's very difficult to take a, a static fossil in and sometimes make it exciting. But what's happened with Walking with Dinosaurs and subsequent programmes is that now the pupils at school have a fantastic image of all these dinosaurs running around and eating each other and, and all sorts of things. So I just add to the images that they've already seen on Walking with Dinosaurs. But it was in the area of science programme making that the impact of Walking with Dinosaurs was most felt. Television couldn't be the same after Walking with Dinosaurs. You couldn't make programmes without thinking of how do you combine dramatic narrative content and, and let's say, special effects. And a, a whole generation of programmes were made as a result of Walking with Dinosaurs. You know, in recent times we've had Super Volcano, Seven Industrial Wonders, Pompeii Coliseum, and all of those programs are influenced by this big cinematic quality and the ability to embrace uh, technology in a way in the service of a great story.